Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. It's nice to have you back again. Uh, Don's handed out two things to you. Uh, uh, it's got eight maps, four maps on one side, four maps on the other side. Start in 2 Samuel chapter 1, going up to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8. And I do want you just to kind of let you know where we were, we're going with this. Is, you know, last week we started with uh, uh, David, uh, you know, being in Ziklag, and we kind of talked about all the men kind of coming to him from, from the north, and how he's not just a, a small band of people, that he's growing to hundreds of thousands of, of men that are coming down to side of him. So when this whole thing starts to develop, you got to remember David's not just a a single man with a, you know, a couple friends hanging out in the wilderness any longer, uh, then when he comes over to Hebron, he begins to gather the whole nation and so, to him. So look at that last map on the, on the second page. It's map 138, if you see the number there. And by the time you get to chapter 8 of 2 Samuel, David has extended the kingdom from the border of Egypt all the way up to the Euphrates River. Uh, you understand what is being said there that and he is he has fought battles and won and so in a matter of just David just moving through and establishing his his uh, kingdom this this takes place you know I mean, as far as history goes fairly quickly so remember in our when we begin second Samuel Israel has fled they've gone across the Jordan the Philistines now occupy northern Israel David's down in Ziglag he's going to come across uh, here we go. Here's Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea, Mediterranean. This up here, the, the Megiddo Valley, Mount Gilboa, Jezreel, uh, all this is, is under Philistine control. They, they fled. The Israelites have fled to the other side. Uh, they're over here. Saul's kingdom is going to be over here. Is the Jabbok River flowing into the Jordan River here. Uh, Mahanian. Uh, this is where Jacob met the camp of angels before he crossed and met Esau. Mahanim right there now is where Saul's family has fled to over here on the, on the east side. That's where Abner and Ishbosheth, Saul's living son, are going to march from here down to Gibeah, which is just like five miles north of Jabesh, which is going to be Jerusalem. And David's down here in Hebron, and they're going to meet right here for the early battle. So that, this place is completely overrun by the Philistines when we start 2 Samuel. By the time you get to chapter 8, David not only has taken control of Judah, he's taken control of all of Israel. The Philistines are no longer an issue. He's got control all the way to the Egyptian border, all the way up into uh, up to the Euphrates River, which, again, is, is fairly amazing. Okay, well, that really wasn't what I was planning on saying, but I, I, did, I was just introducing the class. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Please. If he had control over everything, did he leave one of his captains there to make sure everybody submitted? How did he? Uh, I don't know all of those details. Uh, I do know that he has fought battles. At, we'll read the different battles on the eastern side here and up into here where he's gone and fought battles and won. So he, there's no military threat. We do know that his son Absalom is the son of Telmi, who's the king of Gesher. Which, what is Gesher? We mentioned that last week right towards the end. Right here is that on the Sea of Galilee, the terrible Sea of Galilee. It looks like uh, you know, something off of Dr. Seuss' book. I guess what I've been reading this last summer, <laughs> Dr. Seuss' books. But anyway, uh, there is a, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, the New Testament city? Uh, Bethsaida. That's where Peter was born. That is the city of Gesher in the Old Testament. And so there's, there's a, a kingdom right here called the kingdom of Gesher. It was more of a, a tribal territory. It's not large. But David did not conquer this area, apparently. But he married the daughter of the king, tell me, and she gave him a son, Absalom. And so when Absalom kills his brother Amnon, remember, Absalom flees to grandpa up here and lives in the kingdom of Gesher. So he didn't have to fight that. He didn't necessarily have anybody there like the Romans would have stationed in military uh, divisions. Uh, he'd had a, he had a treaty. So some of this is going to involve treaties. And then, that, and you know, that's when you get into Solomon. Solomon's got you know, all these wives. Uh, those are all peace treaties. Those are all just peace treaties he signed. By I mean, not all of them, but that's one reason why he's got... So a lot of Solomon's peace was not military as much as it was just by treaty. So uh, if there was a revolt, David would go up and conquer it, squelch it, and establish military presence. 
but a lot of it was people just kind of handing stuff over to him right here. He never fought. I don't know if he ever fought right here. He maybe fought in the area, if that answers your question. He, he wasn't, I don't want to call it like an empire like the Romans where David had divisions stationed all over uh, the area. That's encouraging. Anyway, that's some information there that you can see. All right, I'm going to pray that we're going to jump into this and we'll get started. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We do ask that as we look at it this evening that your spirit would bring it to life in our lives, that we would not only understand it but, and, and, and bring it into the perspective that you've got for us, but that we'd be able to apply it to our lives, that we'd see truth for our own day and we could see that your, your behavior, your activity, your nature that you was revealed in Scripture is also the same as it is today. And we ask that we may make that application in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well... Uh, you've got your maps there. You kind of keep those in, in hand. Uh, that very first one, very first map, is 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to read through it very quickly. You've got a man, an, uh, an Amalekite, and it, you, gotta, you, you know the story. You've read the story in 1 Samuel. You read the story last week in, in 1 Chronicles of Saul dying on Mount Gilboa right here. And, and he, was, he was overcome with the arrows, and he fell on his sword. He killed himself. The Amalekite's now going to tell his side of the story. And it would appear that the Amalekite is, is he's coming up on Saul before the Philistines got there. Uh, and he's going to say that Saul wasn't dead, which makes sense. He fell on his sword. He's, he knows he's wounded fatally. He's going to die. So he falls on his sword to finish himself off. But as luck would have it for Saul, you know, way things are going, God's not answering in dreams or visions. He's got to go to a witch to get any kind of a spiritual advice. He tries to kill himself, and it's like, that didn't work out real well either. And so the, Im the image the Amalekite gives you, he's like on, on his sword, shot with arrows, and he's still like, I can't die here. Would someone help me die? Uh, and that's what the Amalekites, and he's going to apparently try to bring, provide a service to Saul. He's going to kill Saul and then take his armband and his, his, his uh, crown. And crowns were different at this time, in different nations, different uh, kingdoms. Uh, had different types of crowns. So think whatever you want to, but we really don't know what his crown looked like. Uh, they have found a few of them. Uh, but anyway, the Amalekite takes that and brings it to David down in Ziklag. It's a three-day journey uh, about, and as he gets down here, and he thinks he's got good news for David. And he's going to tell David, I've, I've done this. And, and it's interesting, again, that an Amalekite finds the, the crown, takes it from Saul. You'll wonder if they had any final words, like, you know, the Amalekite says, you want me to take this to David? <laughs> it's like, that would be the last thing Saul heard. Wouldn't that be just terrible? last thing Saul heard, Saul, I'll make sure David gets the crown. It's like, no. And then he dies. I added that part. If I was writing a movie, I might add that in, but that's not in the Bible. And it comes, he brings that. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. On the third day, remember what had happened. When he got there, his city was gone. Him and his men went off and brought everybody back. They destroyed the Amalekites again, brought every, all the family back, and they're celebrating again. They wanted to stone David. Now David's their leader again. What did I say? I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 1. What did I say? Okay, we'll hold you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm interpreting the Hebrew text as I'm reading. Yeah, I'm sorry. Second Samuel. Okay. Thank you for stopping me. If you don't do this, I would just keep writing. An hour later, I'd still be going. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, two days. I'm, I'm chapter one. Second Samuel, verse two. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and with dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell on the ground to pay him honor. Again, realize, remember, David has got a lot of men with him. David is a, a mighty man right now with a lot of people. The Philistines know him. The Amalekites know him. You wonder how this Amalekite it comes down to David when David has been fighting the Amalekites. But anyway, he must not know, make the connection. He f comes and pays on. He travels this three-day journey down to get to David. Uh, where have you come from, David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened, David answered. Tell me. And again, in this right here, you're not sure, and maybe, maybe we are, you're not sure how much of this is true, how much he's twisting, you know, trying to make it sound good. Maybe he's, he's fabricating part of the story. Uh, you kind of got to think about it several ways. I'm just going to pretend he's telling the absolute truth with the idea that maybe he's fabricating a little bit of it. But here we go. 
Uh, what happened? Tell me. He said, the men fled from the battle. Many of them fell and died. We know that makes sense. And Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. This is true so far. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report. Now again, this is the first time David has heard that Jonathan and Saul are dead. How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? Did you, did you read it on Facebook? Or did you really, I mean, how do you know? I happen to be on Mount Gilboa. Now, what, now again, that, that's, I happen to be, the way it's translated. Were he, was he there plundering the dead? I mean, was he there or was he escaping? Was he one of a slave, was a servant of the Israelites? But anyway, he happened to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said. And there was Saul leaning on his spear. Again, that makes sense, you know, that he, because he killed himself. With the chariots and riders almost upon him. And that's why he wanted to die. Because he knew if he got taken, they already mutilated his body. If he would have been alive, they would have tortured him. Which was not uncommon. So he wanted to die. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me and says, "What?" Or I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. And that's again, remember, Saul was sent on a mission by God to kill all the Amalekites. And now at his death, an Amalekite is there to kill him. Then he said to me, stand over me and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I took, stood over him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. In other words, the Amalekite knows exactly what to do with them. <coughs> For some reason, either they know David's going to be the king. Saul gave him directions, which I highly <coughs> doubt. Verse 11, now watch David and his men's reaction. You would think there'd be celebrating. But remember, their whole nation is, is fleeing. It's a disaster. And their king is dead. And Jonathan, Saul's, you know, or excuse me, Jonathan, David's best friend, is dead. So a lot of these men have lost friends in this battle. And plus the king is dead. Then David and all of his men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till the evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. That's, that's very honorable what they did right there. David said to the young man who brought him the report, Where are you from? I am the son of an alien and a Malachite. Well, now we know an alien, he must have moved into the land of Israel as an alien, was living among them. Uh, David asked him, why were you not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Now, if maybe the Amalekite thought he's going to get some kind of a reward, some kind of a place in David's military, some recognition, when he hears this question, there should have been a cold shudder go down his back. Why weren't you afraid to kill the Lord's anointed? It's like, oh, I didn't think you'd ask that question. Remember, did David have a chance to kill the Lord's anointed? A couple of times, David had the chance... And, and, and you, we could have just, he could have justified it, but he, you know, he, he knew what it meant to kill the Lord's anointed, and he knew God anointed Saul. God could remove Saul. And that's what he said. He says, either you will be killed in battle, or God will remove you some other way, but I am not going to be the one to do it. I'm going to stay in hiding until God deals with the situation. I mean, that's, that's true faith right there. Now, David didn't do everything in his life in true faith, and he learned a lot of things in these last 12 or so years that he's been in the wilderness. But one of the things he learned is, I'll let God do God's part, I'll do my part. And right now, God's part is taking place, but this Amalekite steps up and says, yeah, I did it for him. And David says, why were you not afraid to kill the Lord's anointed? This is the man Samuel anointed that God chose, and you felt comfortable. Now, I mean, I'm not sure what you would have done, or what I, I, what I don't really blame the guy. I mean, you almost are doing him a favor. Here's Saul in the throes of death. He's shot with arrows. He's fallen on his spear. He's not dying. He's going to be mutilated by the Philistines. The best thing you do for him is kill him before the Philistines get here. I mean, I'm thinking it, it would be a good thing to do. But David says, why weren't, you, why weren't you afraid to do this? Then David called out one of his men and says, go, strike him down. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. By doing that, you said it with your own mouth, I killed the Lord's anointed. It's like, it, it just, it, it's interesting. I, nonetheless, it's like, which, what would be the right thing to do? David says, you admitted that you killed him. Maybe he demanded, okay, I'm assuming that the Amalekite's telling the story accurately. There's a lot of things that can be added to it. Some people have taught it this way, that Saul was already dead, and he was plundering the dead before the Philistines got there, and he sees this treasure and thinks, I can cash this in at a you know, pawn shop. Or it's like, wait a minute, if I give this to David, so many people know that David's going to be the next king. The Philistines are even singing about it. 
that he knows if I come down like a hero, maybe he's fabricating the story, and David's just punishing him for fabricating the story and, and trying to take credit for killing Saul. And that's somebody who taught it that way too. And David you know, doesn't necessarily know exactly what happened. But there's that story. Uh, Saul is dead. David's got the crown. And now we go on to chapter uh, 1, verse 17. Uh, one of my favorite, I even put this in a song. When I used to have some kids when I taught kids. We would sing this, in the, so I had a song for this, and I kind of, it's a very, very impressive song, I think, the lyrics. Not the one I wrote, but the lyrics that David wrote. <laughs> David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan. Now remember, Jonathan was a great man of God, a man of faith, a great warrior, a very good friend of David. They even had covenants together. And ordered that the men of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It's interesting that David did not just teach these men how to fight. And he did teach them how to fight. He didn't just teach them courage. He taught them that. He taught them faith. But he also taught them to sing. And this is going to be one of their, their military songs. One of their, their political songs. One of the things that they'd sing it to be qualified for battle. You had to understand the meaning of the song and be able to sing it. So singing was part of it. And it's in the book of Jashar, which we do not have. But we hear it referred to several times. It appears to be a collection of songs or hymns or poems of, of national uh, importance, if they be songs of victory, or in this case, songs of lament, that had, a, had, a, had something that, as far as history that could teach or a lesson that they could learn from. And it would be nice if at some time archaeology could somehow uncover uh, the book of Jashar somewhere. It, who knows? It may still be in existence somewhere, in a monastery somewhere, or whatever. But it would be nice to find something like this. It's, it's a poetic book of, of, of national songs. Here it goes. Chapter 1, verse 19. Your glory, again, your anointing, Saul, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. Saul, your anointed king, lies slain on Mount Gilboa. How the mighty have fallen. He calls Saul mighty. He calls Jonathan mighty. Tell it not in Gath, and of course now we're talking about the Philistines. He says, do not let the Philistines know. And again, this is just wishful thinking, but you know, they already know. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Uh, let, I mean, many of us were in Ashkelon. Right now that whole area is kind of shut down because it's just five miles north of, of Gaza. But Ashkelon, that, that, it's all been excavated. Both these cities have been excavated. They found Philistine remains there. Lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Because they'd be celebrating over here in the streets of, the, of, of Philistia because of the death of the, the king of Israel. He says, verse 21, now he's going to curse Mount Gilboa. O mountains of Gilboa, that means Mount Gilboa and the foothills around it. May you, never, may you have neither dew nor rain nor fields that yield offerings or grain. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled. The shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. They would have many times it'd be a, uh, some kind of a wooden shield wrapped with some kind of leather or some kind of support with it. And they just like you should do your cutting boards, rub your cutting boards with oil. Uh, they'd rub the leather coverings on the, on, the, on the shields with oil to keep them loose. And you know, you've heard all the different stories about different things. But keep them basically flexible so they're, they're moldable, they wouldn't break. Also, some people think they'd help put out the the fiery darts of, you know, out of Ephesians 6. That's another whole conversation. But anyway, no longer rub with oil. You really don't want to rub. You're trying to put out fiery darts, rubbing your shield with oil. You, you see the contradiction there. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. What a compliment right there. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. Meaning Jonathan did not turn his back against the enemy. He faced them and, and faced them in death. Uh, the bow of Jonathan never turned back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. When they came back again, not on this particular day, but historically when the Jonathan and Saul went to battle, Saul's sword did not return unsatisfied. It had its, it, it's had its spill of blood. It had had its drink. Saul and Jonathan, now watch this. In life, they were loved and gracious. And just think, this is David writing about Saul. In life, they were loved and gracious. And in death, they were not parted. And that's, that's again, that is a very heroic thing. Jonathan, after all the things you've heard Jonathan say, say, I know you'll be king. I'll be with you. I'll be under you. I will serve you when you become king. He was willing to follow David, but he had to be loyal to his father. And so he went to the battle with his father, hoping for the best, that they could somehow get out of this. And when everything's over, he could go to David and serve David. But they weren't parted. Even in death, Jonathan stayed with his father. Now you ask yourself, would you have done that knowing this is the losing side, here's the winning side, this side is fighting against God, this side is fighting for God, and you know you've committed to this side here, but you've got 
temporal obligations here. You're the prince. You're, this is your father. This is your country. What do you do? You run off at the end. Jonathan, even right here. It, it says, uh, the, uh, in Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They stayed together and finished the job. I would like to have seen Jonathan live and come serve David and see how things played out. But in this case, this is the way it played out. Uh, they were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Now, O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul. This is a command to the women of Israel. You weep for Saul because this is what he did. He clothed you in scarlet and finery. Your economy was stable. And as he says, because of Saul, he established a kingdom. He brought in trade. He established your economy. You had fine linen. You had fine things because of great leadership in Saul. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed thee in scarlet finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. And once again, verse 27. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. Those two great swords, you know, the swords of Jonathan, the sword of Saul. They're done. They will never defend Israel again. They're in the record books. They've retired. Uh, they're in the Hall of Fame, but they'll never play again. So anyway, there they closes that down. Okay, that's the end of that. Chapter 2 now. In the course of time, which is a nice thing. It wasn't like a rush right into it. David's following God. He's been following God for some 15, 16 years, and now it's, he's not going to rush into this. He, this, he's been waiting for this since he was anointed. Remember, he was anointed coming out of the sheep field. He was anointed to be the king, and then his whole life went into turmoil. And that was maybe 16 years ago. So he's been waiting 16 years for this to happen. He didn't go up and kill Saul and try and take over, because now blood would be on his hands. He is approached, he has now arrived at this point of destiny. This is important. He's arrived at this point of destiny, innocent. God's given him a prophecy, he's given him a direction, he's followed, he's been tested. He, he's failed some of the tests, but he's learned, and he's standing here in the land of the Philistines waiting for God to open the door. And so now he goes. In the course of time, David did what? Inquire to the Lord. Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? Now remember, Israel is overrun. It seems to be a little more stable in this area. We don't hear about the Philistines fighting in this area here. And David's asked, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? Shall I leave the Philistine territory and re-enter the land of Israel or Judah? The Lord said, go up. Okay. David asked, well, a little more information. Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there and with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel, Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Hebron and its towns. That's important. Because you understand, it, it, you've got the city of Hebron. It's not just David pulling in, you know, with a with a wagon full of stuff, you know, like you know the Beverly Hillbillies. I mean, you got a special generation to say that, but you know, he, they pulls in. I mean, he came in. If you go to remember, I think it's Second Chronicles chapter twelve. Is that right? Or First Chronicles chapter twelve? Of all the men, if you go flip over there real quick, just so you can see this. Yeah, First First Chronicles chapter twelve. If you want to, I mean, First Chronicles chapter twelve. You've got, uh, while David was in Ziglag, we referred to this last week, you've got men defecting from the tribe of Benjamin joining David before this battle of the Philistines. They came down and joined David. You've got men from Gad coming down and joining David. You've even got, well, look in chapter, chapter 12, uh, well, verse 1. These were the men who came to David at Ziglag while he was banished from the presence of Saul. Uh, you've got 23 men mentioned there from the tribe of Saul. Uh, go, ahead, go to verse 8. The Gadites defected to David at the stronghold in the desert. Uh, verse 16. Uh, you got some more tribe men of Benjamin and men of Judah came over while David was in a stronghold. Uh, verse 19. Some of the men of Manasseh, notice this word, some of the men of Manasseh, in chapter 12 of 1 Chronicles, verse 19. Some of the men of Manasseh defected to David when he went with the Philistines. So when David goes over to Ziklag, some of the men of Issachar, they defected. They, they left Israel. They, they switched countries. Or see, like Manasseh, from the, man, from the tribe of Manasseh. Okay, that is who came over to him before this battle. So he's already gathering. Saul's military has started joining him, saying, we're done, we're out of this. We can see the air of this. Now, 
in chapter. So in other words, when David goes from Ziklag to Hebron, all those men come with him. He, he's bringing a mill. That's why it says Hebron and its towns. He didn't just move into Hebron. He may have, but they had to settle in the area. So David moves in. The whole area, the whole economy changes. And when he gets there, now we're just while we're here, look in chapter 12, verse 23. These are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron. Now this is astonishing if you add these numbers together. While he's here, these men now, this, the military of Israel collapsed. Now he's going to have men from the tribes come down and join him. They join him at Hebron. Looking right here, chapter uh, verse 24, 6,000 men from Judah, 7,000 from Simeon, 4,000 from Levi, uh, 3,000 from Benjamin, Saul's own tribe, 20,000 from Ephraim. Uh, going on down, you've got 28,000 from Dan. You've got 40,000 from Asher. You've got apparently 120,000 coming from the east side coming over. I mean, you're talking, you're, you're, you've got hundreds of thousands of men joining David or committing to David in, in military after he's joined. So he goes from Ziklag over to Hebron. So again, don't think of David as a little shepherd boy that became king. Indeed, he was a shepherd boy at one time. But this time, he's commanding a large group of people. Trained military men have come over to him. Okay, we go back to chapter 2, two of 2 Samuel. So he goes up to Hebron, chapter 2 of 2 Samuel, verse 2. So David went up there with his two wives, Ohinom and Abigail. Uh, David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now the men of Judah, so the elders of Judah. Now remember, there's 12 tribes. This is the tribe of Judah. And, and you know this, you've got maps in your Bible. This would be the tribe of Judah right here. The tribe of Benjamin is in this area. Next to that would be Ephraim. Got some Manasseh on this side, Manasseh on this side. Issachar, uh, Dan's gone up into here. Uh, you know, all the way through in this area. What else am I missing here? But anyway, it was just this tribe right here. Simeon kind of lives with Judah, if you understand that. Levi doesn't really have any territory because they've been given their portion before the Lord. They're kind of struggling right now because the tabernacle's gone, the temple's not been built, the, the Ark of the Covenant's at Kirim, or Jerim, Kir, Kiriath Jerim. So anyway, the men of Judah. And so David's going to become king of Judah. Just this tribe. That's all he's the king of. He's going to be king of of Judah, and he's going to rule in Hebron here uh, for seven and a half years. But now up here, these other 11 tribes, that's what's going to take place right now. Remember the general. Who's David's general? David's general is Joab, his cousin. And Joab's got two brothers, Ashiel and Abishai. And those are sons of Zariah, David's sister. So the Joab is the main guy. These guys are all military mighty men. Up here, Saul's general is Abner, and that's his cousin. Uh, but who's king up here? Jonathan's dead, all the sons of dead except one, Ish-bosheth. And remember the name we saw that last week was Ish-baal, which means uh, uh, man of Baal, or what does it mean? A man of thunder, lightning, or something. And it seems like it's been changed in another, in 2 Samuel, it's been changed from Baal to Bosheth, which means that a man of power, man of uh, Baal, man of thunder or lightning, it means man of shame or something. I mean, it's, they've changed his name saying, why did Saul even name his son after Baal? But anyway, we're going to call him Ishbosheth tonight is the king of these, these, these tribes up here. This is Saul's son, Ishbosheth, is now the standing king. And realize he's ruling from over here because this kingdom is occupied by the Philistines. Now, again, Jonathan's going to have a son, right, who's already been born, and his name is Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth was a little boy when Jonathan fell on Mount Gilboa. And when they all fled from Gibeah of Saul, right here, they fled. This is where the Saul's kingdom was, right next to Gibeon, was Gibeah of Saul. They fled across the other side. The nurse dropped Mephibosheth, damaged his legs, and we'll pick that up later. And so he's a cripple. That's Jonathan's son. Okay, here we go. We are now in chapter one, or chapter two, verse eight. We've talked about David's was anointed by the, the elders of Judah. They've made him their king. They've anointed him. They've come together. He's officially the king. He's got a strong military base, a very strong military base, as we just read. Okay, but now, verse eight. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanian. Over here. 
That's the only place they had left. He made him king over Gilead, Ashurai, and Jezreel, and over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. So he starts naming places over here, cross over to Jezreel, Benjamin, basically all of Israel. He names him king. Now, he's in king by title, but now he's got to conquer his territory because his territory is occupied by the Philistines. Okay, we're naming you king. We're hoping you'll go back and get the territory. Ishbosheth, verse 10 of chapter 2. Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. So right here we got, we got a, you can hear the civil war coming. Here you've got David, you've got Ishbosheth. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, son of Ner, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, left Mahanaim and went to Gibeon. Now, you, you, we've showed you a lot of pictures of Gibeon. You know, there's that high place of Gibeon where Saul anoint, was anointed by Samuel. And Gibeon is the city right there at the base. It's about five, six miles north. There's a, you can still see it, I mentioned last week, a huge pool there. Uh, it's got stairs cut in the uh, stone. It's just very deep, crazy deep. And you can still see it with the stairs going down. It dates back to this time, a huge pool that was a water reservoir in Gibeon. Here's Jerusalem. We're about six miles just on the other side of the high place of Gibeon. I've showed you pictures of that. If you Google this pool of Gibeon, if you go home and Google it, you'll be able to see a wide range of good, good photos of this, even older pictures from the 1800s possibly. But you can see some very good. I've never been there. I've looked at it from the high place, looked down. wish I could go down, but I never gone down there. Uh, so here we go. Verse 12, Abner son of Ner, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, left Mahanian and went to Gibeon. Leave Mahanian, come over to Gibeon. Joab, son of Zeruiah, and David's men went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. So now, Joab leads David's men. I can imagine the men that he's leading. He, 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 a mighty military goes up to meet Ishbosheth and men and General Abner. So you got General Joab versus General Abner. Uh, one group sat down on one side of the pool and one group on the other side. Now you can start hearing the Greek, and we, you don't have to accept this, but I do want to mention it, because the Philistines, as we've talked about, were probably Greeks coming in at this time, the sea people that the Egyptians dealt with. They came in by land, they came in by sea, and so they brought with them Greek lifestyle. You can find the Greek pottery. They're clearly Greeks. The Bible calls them from Captor. This, not the Genesis Philistines, but the Philistines of David's day were sea people from Greece. Uh, captor, they came in from the islands. They brought, they brought their technology, they brought their pottery, and it's, it's provable archaeology. But they also brought that the hero style of battle that you can see in the Greek uh, Homer's legend stuff where one guy will face the other guy, everybody else will watch, and they'll, they'll solve the battle. And we saw an example of that where? David and Goliath. They brought out their hero, says, you send your hero. That's exactly out of the way the Greeks fought. And so now they come up here at the pool. That, that, that that hero, or what do we want to that hero? There's a better word for it. It's slipping my mind. Where you've got a representative going off to represent your military. Uh, <clears throat> not here. I'm trying. There's a better word for it. Where you've just got an individual. That's what they're going to do here. It, it, there's going to be several battles where the individual steps up to fight as a representative. <clears throat> and here's what they do. They're, they're one group sitting on one side of the pool, the other on the other side. Then Abner... Saul's old general, the Israel general, said to Joab, David's general, let's have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand in front of us. All right, let them do it, Joab said. So they stood up and they were counted off. Twelve men from Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve from David. Now realize, we just called this entire northern kingdom, we called it what? Benjamin. You see that? Twelve from the men of Benjamin. Not necessarily from the, maybe from the tribe of Benjamin, but probably referring from, we got Judah versus Benjamin is what it is. Because we're fighting in the land of Benjamin. But it's Israel. So they took twelve men. And this is not going to go very well. They each grabbed, each, then each man grabbed his opponent. It's going to be a, you know, twelve on twelve, one on one little contest. They each grabbed each other, stabbed each other. They grabbed the opponent by the head, thrust his dagger into the opponent's side, and they fell down together. Well, that wasn't much of a game. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, so that place in Gibeon was called, whatever that word and it means right there, the, the, the field of daggers. It's like, because everybody had a day, they just didn't get very far. Okay, but that was like the jump ball. That was like the kickoff. 
Uh, the battle that, that day was very fierce. I mean, they started fighting. And Abner and his men of Israel were defeated by David's men. I mean, I think they've got a decent military, but David's men, I, apparently, especially after our dis description we got out of Second Chronicles, basically just drove them back. And so Joab is defeating Abner. The three sons of Zariah, that's David's sister, were there. Joab, Abishai, and Ashiel. Now, Ashiel was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He chased Abner. Turn, he's chasing the the general from uh, Israel, turning neither to the right or to the left as he pursued him. So Israel's general and Israel's military is on the flee, and this is Ashiel's big moment to become one of the great, great men of David's military. He's going to kill the general. It would be like killing Alexander the Great or something. Not quite, but anyway. Verse 20, Abner looked behind him and asked, Is that you, Ashiel? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to the right or left, take on one of the young men and strip him of his weapons. Meaning, go kill somebody else your own age and take his weapons and go back to the party and wave his sword and his helmet around. But don't come fight me. Please, go kill somebody your own age. It's not that Abner's afraid. It's, he's afraid. Both Joab and Abner are political, very politically astute, very wise. And he realized, if I kill you, I'm going to have a problem with your general, your brother. <clears throat> Abner looked behind him and asked, okay, okay, where am I at? Okay, but Ashiel would not stop chasing him. Again, Abner warned, Ashiel, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I, how could I look your brother, Joab, in the face? Meaning he's planning on having some negotiation with the, the, these two tribes. And again, you, you're going to, I kind of like Abner. You know, he's giving this guy a chance. But Ashiel refused to give up the pursuit. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, this is a chance to kill Abner. I mean, go for it. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Ashiel's stomach, and the spear came out through his back. Now, you could translate that. He, he thrust his spear backwards. In other words, he just took the point and just ran it. But while he's running, just killed him by running it backwards. It could be translated that way. But the way it's translated is fine. It means he's running the spear and just takes the butt of the spear and pushes it back. And it's many times, and you can see them in books, the, not only the spear head, but you can find the cap that would go on, the, the wooden rod would go on. There's a butt of the spear. It's not sharp necessarily, but it does come down more towards a point. Remember Saul, when David was hollering down and Saul was sleeping, and his spear was stuck in the ground. It was stuck with the, the butt in the ground, the point up. So anyway, that's what he, he just, that, that iron point on the back of the spear, the cap basically, and runs that through Ashiel. Um, uh, and, and, and he fell there, he came out his back, he fell there, he died, and every man stopped when it came to the place where Ashel had fallen and died. Because he was kind of like a, a celebrity, he was kind of like one of the up and coming, he was the brother of the general. Is that a question? Yeah, What's, where are we in the time period of the two years for uh, Ishbosheth? Ishbosheth. Um, and, and, uh, and Abner? And Abner? Uh, I think we're in, I'm going to, I don't know for sure, I would say the first six months. I think it's fairly early because there are some things that are going to develop here. Um, we, we can maybe take, when we finish reading a little bit more, do a better job so of chronicle. king about the same time. Yes, right. Ishbosheth, and yes. Abner made Ishbosheth king uh, when Saul died. It would be a matter of days, weeks, probably within, uh, you know, this, it says here, uh, in the course of time. Meaning there was a little bit of time or wait. Like, I don't know how long that was, but it wasn't, it wasn't a rush. David allowed God to lead him. So about the time the men are anointing David here, Abner's made sure Ishbosheth is king over here. And again, yeah, yeah, you've got to, all this state place within two years. I think it's probably in that first year. Arlen, you want to add something? No, you just got to count, go backwards and say, well, Ishbosheth, when he was dead, when, he, when they killed him, go back two years. And how long had David been ruling at that time? Well, you're saying maybe five and a half? Oh, Is no. What you're saying? No. No, I think maybe became king at the same time. I think when Ishbosheth dies, okay, David is were, finishing his second year. There was a gap before he was anointed king for. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking weeks, months. I don't well, think. Well, from the time that David spent seven and a half years, so the two years goes against David's two, first two and a half years. Right. Okay, two years. Then <coughs> he's got another. Yeah, I think Ishbosheth, I, I'm going to say David, then after Ishbosheth is dead, David's going to rule from Hebron. In fact, as the story goes, when Ishbosheth dies, there's going to be some transition here. Uh, actually, when Abner dies, they're all, all of these tribes are going to come to Hebron and say, David, will you be our king? Yeah. And then David's going to rule all of Israel for apparently about five years yeah. from Hebron. 
And then for political reasons, that's when he says, we're going to move the capital up here to Jerusalem. That's, that's, I think, so then he's going to rule for, he's going to rule 40 years altogether. So then it'd be like seven and a half years minus 40 gives you that number. Okay, here we go. Uh, verse 26, oh, they, everybody, everybody uh, stopped when they saw Ashiel laying there. Verse 24, but Job and Ab Abishai pursued Abner. His two brothers continued to pursue Abner. And as the sun was setting, they came to the hill of Amma near Gia on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. We don't know where that's at, but you assume they're fleeing this way. And there's some place over here in the wasteland away from Gibeah towards the Jordan River. They come to this place where Abner's kind of regrouping himself. They formed themselves into a group and took their stand on the top of the hill. And Abner called out to Joab, must the sword devour forever? In other words, he's going to ask for tru truce or peace. Let's just end this. Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their brothers? Because realize, in, in a matter of months, these two groups are going to become one nation. In other words, let's not make this worse than it is. Again, you've got to admire Abner's foresight. You, you can see personalities. Joab is, is Joab. He's, he's looking to keep David as king, and he's looking to establish power. He doesn't want to be the king, but he's going to, he's going to defend David. You can see Abner looking into the future, realizing this is, they're both apparently men of faith, because at one point, Joab, towards the end of his, David's life, he's going to warn David that he's not following mo the Mosaic law. He says, you're going, to, you're going to bring disaster on the people. And that's when he, he went out and counted them in. Joab says, don't count them. And why wouldn't you count them? Because the word of God says, don't count them. And so Joab was giving him, in this case, biblical advice. Abner appears to be looking forward, realizing we're not fighting, we're not changing God's plan, we're not changing God's will. We are the nation of Israel. We've got a civil war going, but let's let's end this respectfully so we can we don't have so much damage control to take care of in the future. Verse 28. So Joab blew the trumpet on verse 27. Job answered. As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued to pursuit of their brothers until morning. You can hear both the men, Abner looking for the, to the future, and Job looking, I would have crushed you today in spite of what we have to deal with in the future. You can, they're, they're both, the personalities are there. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the men came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight anymore. All that night, Abner and his men marched through the Arabah, that's the Jordan Valley, that's this distance coming up to the Jordan and leaving the Jordan, heading up to Mahanim. They marched, they led the out of the country as quick as they could. They marched all the night, they crossed the Jordan, continued through the whole Bithron and came to Mahanim, their home. Then Job returned from pursuing Abner and assembled all of his men. Besides Ashiel, 19 of David's men were found missing. Get that, 19. That's... That's a pretty, pretty good job. When David's men had killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner, they took Ashiel and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. I mean, that's the family, where the family's from. Uh, then Joab and his men marched all night and arrived at Hebron at daybreak. Chapter 3. The war between the house of Saul, north Israel, and the house of David, the tribe of Judah, lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Sons who were born to David in Hebron. Again, he's going to be here for seven and a half years. Uh, we've still got to go back and finish that two years while Ishbosheth is on the throne. But during his time there, you've got his sons that were born. I think we read through this last week, maybe in, in, in second, or First Chronicles. Uh, you've got Absalom there, Maacah, uh, son of Maacah. That's the tell me. That's You see in verse, what is it, verse 3, what I talk about. Bethsaida. Uh, the, lady, the, the queen's name or the princess's name was Maacah. She was the daughter of Telmi, who must have made a peace treaty with David. And got, got some other ones listed there. Okay, chapter uh, 3, verse 6. During the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Now, this is different than Joab. Joab never seems to have strengthened his own position, he always seemed to strengthen David's position. And that was some, sometimes they didn't see it the same way. Sometimes David was more willing to walk in faith, was more willing to be trusting of somebody, try it one more time. And Joab always had one answer. Let's kill him. 
We're wondering if they're on our side. Well, let's kill them, then we know. We don't have to worry about it. David, well, we should follow God. If we kill him, we don't need to worry about it. So Joab, a lot of times, he was, he, he was always protecting David. He, he tests that theory. I mean, he, I, that's what I see. But right here it says Abner was strengthening what? His own position. Abner's realized Isbosheth, I mean, he's Saul's son. Isbosheth's not going to pull this off. But if I can somehow hold him up until the right time, and then I'll maybe come down as a general to David or hand everybody over, or I'll become king, whatever. He's strengthening. His, it says right here, um, where am I at? Abner was, okay. Six. Six. Thank you. During the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine named Rispa. Uh, it, it, within her name, Rispa, it is the word hot. Like hot one or hot babe or something like that. So just it, do what you want. Do what I mean, it, it means Saul had a concubine named Rispa. You do want to forget here because in chapter 21 of this book, uh, chapter 21, verses 8 through 11, this woman, her sons are going to be taken and given to the Gibeonites. Again, this is a wild story. You, you know where I'm going with this? Here's Gibeon. I know it's a terrible map. That's the Gibeonites' city. They came over and made a treaty with Joshua. They still lived in Gibeon. The Gibeonites were Gibeonites, or Hittites. Uh, but they were they're Canaanites originally. Saul lived right there in Gebe, Geba, which was right, just like two miles to the, the east, right there. And for some reason, while he was king, it doesn't tell us clearly in the scriptures, but we do have the fallout later on in 2 Samuel, that a plague comes on the land. There's no rain. And the reason for the rain was that Saul, while he was king, tried to kill all the Gibeonites, tried to clean the land, clean the lands of the Gibeonites, because they weren't, and it, you just see, I mean, he's two miles from their city. He grew up hating them. They're not supposed to be here. They're not really Israelites. And there's some kind of ethnic cleansing that he must have attempted, apparently, and tried to kill them all. Well, then during David's reign, there's rain as king, there's no rain from the atmosphere, and there's a famine. So they asked, well, what's wrong? And the answer came back, because of Saul's actions against the Gibeonites, I can't bless the land. And so David then goes and asks the Gibeonites, what can we do to make up for this? They says, give us some of Saul's sons. I think it was five, you can go back and read it. And they took five, and they'd be this lady's sons, or her, her relatives, and they, they execute them and laid them out before the Lord, and she sat there and tried to keep the bird. She mourned for them and kept the birds off their dead bodies. And then it says, and it started to rain. That's the story. Okay, but anyway, this is her. She's going to come up later on probably as an older lady with her sons as men being executed as a sacrifice so God will let it rain in the land of Israel because Saul tried ethnic cleansing the Gibeonites who Joshua made a treaty with in Gilgal. You know, when people say, I don't understand the Bible. That's a good place to start right there. How, how's that all work? Just, you just better keep reading, studying, and, and praying, I guess. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative. I'm just saying that's just not a Sunday school material right there introduced. Someone gets saved, let's take him right here and teach him that story about Rizba, the hot one. who. Yeah. Abner had been strengthening his position in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine named Rizba, daughter of Ai, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Now, there's several reasons why he would have slept with his father for Saul's concubine. One, just her name. But the other one is what? Why would Ishbosheth be upset? Because once, and this is this what Absalom, this is all going to play out several times in the story, is when a king, it's, it's going to happen here real quickly here in this story, is whenever a, a king has a wife, if she's ever separated from her, him, or if someone else can capture her, uh, if he dies and someone else can possess that wife or that concubine, they've got a claim to the throne. In other words, there's a, you have a, a position. You have a legal claim to the throne. If you've got the king's concubine, you've got the king's wife, then maybe I should be the king. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to make sense to us, but that's the way it went. And so the very fact that Abner has taken Saul's concubine, Rizba, and slept with her is to Ishbosheth, I think, what he's upset about is... That's you're set. You're you're trying to set the table for your own. You're trying to take over the throne. It, it's a, it's a it's a coup of some sort. Adam was very angry because of what Ishbosheth said and answered. Am I a dog's head on Judah's side 
This very day I am loyal to the house of your father Saul and to his family and friends. I haven't handed you over to David. Now here you can hear what he's saying. He said, am I, on, am I a dog on David's side? Am I, am I, I'm on your side. I've been helping you get everything. You, I anointed you king. I made you king. Just because I've done this, now you come against me? Now watch what he says right here. I am loyal to your father's house uh, to this very day. I haven't handed you over to David. In other words, I could have taken you put you in chains, walk down to Hebron, and handed you to David, and this whole battle's over. He says, I've got your back, and you better start respecting me. Well, it made him mad. Saul and his family and friends, I, I haven't handed you over to David, yet now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman. May God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him on oath and transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and establish David's throne over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. In other words, he knows the prophecy. It's not just Samuel and Jesse and David that know the prophecy. We already know this. The Philistines know it. Everyone knows the prophecy. Abigail, Nabal's wife, knew the prophecy when David came over to kill uh, Nabal at Mount Carmel. And now Abner says, okay, I was trying to help you out. I was trying to do a little bit of political action, but right now, forget it. Be, let God deal with me ever so severely if I do not now just hand this whole thing over to David. I'm done. You're done. He said, you, you no longer have my, my support. So, verse 12. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to say to David, whose land is it? Is that not a current issue question? Whose land is it? <laughs> whose land is it? Make an agreement with me and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. So Abner is now, I think, maybe rushing. He had a game plan here that involved sleeping with Rizba, involved strengthening his own hand, had a couple other plays he probably wanted to make. He's in the chess game. We talked about the chess game. He's in the man's chess game trying to position. And now he's kind of rushing his game. He's rushing his game. He said, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to hand the kingdom over to you. What, what, what do I need to do? Good, said David, verse 13. I will make an agreement with you. So David says, okay, Abner, I'm ready to make a treaty with you as the representative of Israel. But watch what he asks for. Watch what he asks for. But I demand one thing of you. How important is it? Do not come into my presence unless you bring Michal, daughter of Saul, when you come see me. Remember who Michal is? Michal was the daughter that, that Saul gave David, his royal daughter, as an award. But nonetheless... It was, it was an official marriage. They were married. They, they had lived together. They had some stories that we read earlier. But then when David fell out of Saul's favor, he gave Michal to another man. Dissolved that marriage and gave Michal to another man. Well, michal has been living with that man happily in their little villa there in Israel. Uh, but he says, do not come into my presence unless you bring Michal, daughter of Saul, when you come see me. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, demanding... Give me my wife, Michal, who I betrothed to myself for the price of 100 Philistine foreskins. In other words, I want her back. And why does he want her back? Because the claim to the throne. It's not that he loves her or that he cares about her. It's she is now a, a, a weakness in my protection as far as my legal right to the throne. I want her back in my court. So Isbosheth gave orders and had her taken away from her husband. Uh, Pel, Peltael was his name. Petel, son of Laish. Her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, go back home. So he went back home. So her husband, he comes in, the, the military shows up, grabs his wife, says, we're taking her back down to Judah. He goes, what? I, and it's like, you know, apparently he liked her, you know. And he cries and goes after her the whole way until Abner, the general, says, Get on out of here. Get back. And then, of course, he turned and went back. Always oh, would have gotten killed. So I don't have this big weeping scene as he brings the big Mikel. So it's like, it's a, there's a love story right there. I mean, you want to have a chick flick. you got this, this guy. He loves his wife right there. And David, now all of a sudden, David's the bad guy. Anyway, her husband, however, went with her. Okay, verse 17. Abner conferred with the elders of Israel while he was there. So he had the wife. And notice he gets Ishbosheth to, with his, his uh, 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 royal power, to get the wife away, and then he takes her down and uses her for as his payment, you know, to David, and then begins negotiating how he can hand the kingdom over to David and just cut Ishbosheth out of the picture. Uh, Abner conferred with the elders of Israel and said, For some time you have wanted to make David your king. Now he's talking to the elders of, of Israel. That this is up north up here. Uh, now do it. In other words, we've already seen their military men go over to David. Many of their best military men are down with David in Hebron. And now he says, you guys know you want to make David king. 
You, you don't want Ishbosheth. Saul's leadership was a disaster. You've got the anointing. You've seen his. He was one of our best military leaders ever. Let's just hand our kingdom over to him. He says now, and he says you've been talking about this for several years. And again, this is kind of what kept Saul, I think, afraid of David because there's this continuous talk about how good a king would David be. And he, because there had to be something fueling Saul for those those many years that he pursued him. Uh, for some now, okay, now do it. For the Lord had promised David, now here's, your, here's a quote, for the Lord promised David, quote, by my servant David I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. He quotes him, uh, some kind of a prophecy that it was within the, the, the anointing of David or something that's been handed down. And what's their big problem right here? Well, they're over here on this land because they're in front of the Philistines in their, their own land. And he says, don't you know, the, promise, the prophecy is that through David, he'll deal with the Philistines. There's no prophecy he's going to deal with the Philistines through Ishbosheth. You can sit here and protect Ishbosheth if you want to, but you're never going to get your land back. The best deal, if you want to follow the word of God, is submit to David, and David is the, the doorway to drive out the Philistines. Abner also spoke to the Benjamites in person. That's Saul's tribe. Then he went to Hebron to tell David everything that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin wanted to do. When Abner, who had 20 men with him, came to David in Hebron, David prepared a feast for him and his men. Then Abner said to David, Let me go at once and assemble all of Israel for my lord the king, so they may make a compact with you, and that you may rule over all your heart's desire. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. So they, okay, you go get everybody lined up. We'll have a big ceremony. Probably have some stones standing up. They'll have a sacrifice. They'll have an anointing. They'll make a covenant between all these. It'll be a great ceremony. And who's one of the key players? Abner. Abner's one that he's bringing. He's the negotiate. He's in the middle of the game. Who's getting cut out of this picture? Verse 22. Just then David's men and Joab returned from a raid and brought with them a great deal of plunder. They must have gone down there. Just, you know, Joab can't sit still. He's out killing somebody. But Abner was no longer with David in Hebron because David had sent him away and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all his soldiers with him arrived, he was told that Abner, son of Ner, had come to the king, and that the king had sent him away, and that he had gone in peace. Meaning he was here and we didn't kill him. So Joab went to the king and says, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why didn't you let why did you let him go? Now he is gone. You know Abner, son of Ner. He came to deceive you and observe your movements and find out everything you are doing. In other words, notice Joab. Joab is seriously suspicious of Abner. He says, I know Abner. I've sat across the table. I've looked in his eyes. He doesn't mean, you know, it's, you know, the old George Bush and Putin idea. He says, you can't trust this guy. He says, and you just let him walk away. He says, well, yeah, we've got a treaty. So Joab, uh, verse 26, Joab is not worried, I don't think, about becoming king someday himself. Joab is worried about David. Job then left David and sent messengers to Abner, and they brought him back to the well of Sarah. But David did not know it. So he sends. A, he says, oh, David wants to talk to you, Abner. Can you come on back real quick? We've got another development in our plan. Now when Abner returned to Hebron, Job took him aside into the gateway as though to speak with him privately. Come here, it's just between you and me. And there to avenge the blood of his brother Ashiel, and remember, Abner, Abner says, don't do this. How will me and your brother ever be able to negotiate? And so Ashiel continued. He got killed. There to avenge his brother Ashiel, Joab stabbed him in the stomach, and he died. Later, when David heard about this, he says, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May his blood fall upon the head of Joab and upon his father's house. May Joab's house never be without someone who has a running sore or leprosy or who's who, who leans on a crutch or who falls by the sword or who lacks food. Job and his brother Abishai I murdered Abner because he had killed their brother Ashiel in the battle of Gibeon. Then David said to Joab and all the people with him, Tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and walk in mourning in front of Abner. King David himself walked behind the bier. Uh, they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept also. The king sang a lament for Abner. We'll pick this up next week. But basically what ends up right here, David is making a huge public demonstration. I had nothing to do with the death of Abner. But he doesn't want to mess up God's plan and then people's hearts coming to him because he, he conspired against their general Abner. He says, I want people to know I, this wasn't me. This was Job. But the question you've got to ask, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's you're going to ask it several times. Why, if Joab did this thing, 
Why doesn't David just bring Job in and says, Joab, you're fired? Why did he just get rid of it? There's going to be several times where it's like, I would think you would just say, Job, this is enough of the craziness. He always, often complains, the sons of Zariah, I can't, I can't put up with this anymore. I don't even think like you think. But he doesn't get rid of them. I don't know. I don't think he's afraid of them. I don't know. Is he, is he, is he, he uses them. He needs them. They're his, they're his protection. You do know, and we've read it earlier, when he makes Solomon, when he anoints Solomon as king, Joab is going to side with, uh, uh, um, well, who's this now? Not, not Absalom. Adonijah. 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 Side with Adonijah be king, and he tells David, on his deathbed, tells Solomon, he says, do this. Make sure that you do not let Joab's gray head go down to the grave in peace. First thing, when I die and you get anointed, the first thing you do is you kill Joab. It's like, well, why didn't you kill Joab, David? And it gets, maybe it's because of his faithfulness that Joab has shown him. But it's just a question worth answering. He never kills Joab. Uh, well, he does, a, he does fire him one time after Absalom's revolt. And then his replacement, Amasa, his new general, gets killed by, Ab, or killed by Joab. So it's like, you never, want, you never want to replace Joab. He'll just kill you, take his job back. So anyway, I'll pick this up next week. Thank you for listening. There's a thousand questions, but you can see these things kind of uh, uh, coming together uh, and a lot, of, a lot of details there. I do appreciate your patience. Thank you for being here. I'll pray and we're done. Father, we do thank you again for the chance to look into your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the history you've recorded. We thank you for seeing your people and how they think and how they act and how you enter, how you respond back to them, Father. We thank you for your faithfulness to your word, to your word to David, just like you're faithful to us in the words that you've given to us. Father, we ask that we would be faithful to you, learn your truth, and walk in it at this time in history. In Jesus' name we pray.